Who doesn't love a good Netflix binge? With 1.4 billion total minutes of viewing to date, the immensely popular Netflix series Bridgerton has given us period romance viewing with a contemporary twist. If you've danced, swooned and courted through the initial episodes, you'll no doubt have heard some pretty cool string quartet renditions of some of today's most popular songs from Shawn Mendes, Ariana Grande and Maroon 5 to Billie Eilish. You'd be listening to the music of Vitamin String Quartet and the work of their record label, CMH Label Group. Joining us today from CMH are Aaron Silverstein, Head of Film and TV Licensing, and James Curtis, their A&R and Project Director. Welcome, Aaron and James. How are you doing today? Very good. Very good. Thank you for having us, Victoria. Oh, I'm so excited to have you both on. And, you know, Bridgerton is such a hot thing right now. And Vitamin String Quartet, BSQ, as they're known, they're also so hot as well. But first of all, I have to out myself. I've got my Bridgerton outfit on. And, I, you know, I actually went out and got something. I'm so, like, a teenager right now. And I've even got restrictive underwear on, just so I can really get into the whole mode. I had, like, um, you know, diamonds and things like that. But my husband just went, <laughs> it much it much <laughs> i guess he's not used to seeing me look like a girl but um you guys i where are your outfits in the laundry that's a cl- chalk it up to that i just forgot my ticket haven't picked it up from the laundromat yet <laughs> uh, i'll have my wardrobe change hopefully second half that's second half. where we're headed don't quote me on this but apparently corset sales are up as of late so <laughs> You know, who knows? And, uh, maybe mine will arrive and I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to hold you to that, Aaron. I'm going to okay. get the wardrobe change halfway through. So. <laughs> Um, So first of all, I really want to congratulate you both on Vitamin String Quartet and the success of Bridgerton. And I think you realized you've probably upped the cool factor on strings as well, right? Yeah, it seems to be the case. That seems to be the case. Our numbers, if anything, are indicative in a jump in interest for that. That's true. Yeah, and I feel like, too, that um, today's string string uh, or violinists are now the answer to the, the 80s cock rock um, shredding, <laughs> shredding guitarist. What do you think? Oh, we have a few of those on our roster, right, Aaron? Yeah. We definitely yeah. have a few of those on our roster. There's a, one of our lead violinists, Earl Manian. Go look him up. Not only the stuff he does with us, but he has a metal string quartet called Seven Sons. And I mean, they just, he shreds and they're all, they're all secretly metal musicians. I think every one of them, even the ones who don't want to admit it, they all just want to wail on those things. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. It's so much fun. Um, so from the ocean of great content available that's out there, why do you think that Bridgerton and the string covers in particular have resonated so strongly with audiences? Well, that's yeah. a good question. Well, no one's actually asked that yet. I mean, Aaron, do you, uh, shockingly, no one has asked exactly why it's resonated. They've well, asked I, I how think, it's happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are a few factors, right? It's kind of the perfect storm. You've got... Yeah. Um, VSQ and, you know, Vitamin String Quartet's been around and kind of doing this for a very long time, right? It's been a, a, a very well-established thing that now sort of is in the public eye, but the reality is, is VSQ has been kind of working at its craft for a very long time. And so I think the quartet does what, you know, they do very well, right? And also there was this sort of great period piece and there was a great placement, but, you know, they wanted a bit of a twist. They wanted just a little bit of a surprise, right? If you watch the show and you're like, oh, I know that melody. Oh, who yeah. the, oh it's Ariana Grande. Like, that sort of like discovery portion for the viewer, I think is really exciting because you kind of get best of both worlds where it's not just the pop track out of nowhere and it completely pulls you out of the show. You still have the familiar sounds of, oh, here's strings and you're seeing violinists on camera. It all fits and yet there's like, a bit of a twist. And I think it just, the production knew what they wanted. We happen to be doing what we're doing already. And it just kind of like the Venn diagram magically, you know, overlapped and it it all came together. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nothing really new kind of the point that you're making, Aaron. I mean, 
it's just right time, right place, but it's something we've been doing regularly for so long. And, and there have been other shows and other medium that have done this. It's not an entirely new idea. It's just something that kind of exploded at the right time because of all the people involved with Shondaland involved with Netflix timing it perfectly for Christmas. Obviously the source material is something that people really responded to, but the idea of the sort of contemporary classical mixed with like a period piece vibe, you know, we've kind of been down that path before we had successful placements in Westworld. We also had a kind of slew of placements in this TV show called rain that ran for a few seasons on the CW. And that's a perfect example of like the whole milieu was very sort of medieval and, and kind of big epic storytelling, but they wanted to keep it contemporary. So again, string quartet versions of this pop music that speaks to a youthful audience that of course consumes most of this media more than almost anybody else. Yeah, so going back to when you first signed BSQ, mm -hmm. did you have a vision then of what it could become or, or did you just think, hey, these guys are pretty cool, good musicians, let's take a chance. And now you're saying, hey, we're geniuses to everyone. Well, the, the funny thing is, is that VSQ is actually a label creation. It, it originally started as a series of string quartet tribute albums, like in late 99. And at the time, neither Aaron nor I were there. Uh, uh, so uh, I know that basically there were a few years where it was just a bunch of different string quartet albums coming out. And then I came on board around 2005, 2006, and there was a sort of two-prong involvement for me. I came into the label as a internet marketing rep and customer service guy. But then right after I started, I got really involved in the album production, the coordination, and I also wanted to sign different bands and things. So right around 2006, 2007, there was an initiative that I was part of to push all this content onto the digital marketplace. You know, this was the first wave of us getting on iTunes and eMusic and a lot of the first wave of big DSPs. And when we did that, we had this notion of we need to put all these albums under sort of a unifying umbrella. And we thought, let's just give it an artist name and kind of work from there. So it's really it's it's a little backwards in that sense. You know, the label, the subsidiary label at the time was called Vitamin Records. And we struggled for a while to figure out what to name this thing. And I eventually just said Vitamin String Quartet. That's the label. It rolls off the tongue quite nicely. And what also happened not that long around that time, not too long after, was uh, Leo Flynn, who's the brand manager and one of our creative directors alongside me and the rest of the team there. He and I started really getting more involved in trying to shape this and make it sound more like a, an artist. You know, so gave it an aesthetic, gave it a, a sound, an approach, something a little bit more unified than the different albums that had come out before. And it, it was just one of those things where it took off and got a life of its own online because of the, the, the marketplace. But we were also pushing to do things with it that hadn't been done before, trying to do sheet music sales, trying to do live shows because people were asking for that, you know, that kind of stuff. And that was also around the time of, more of a social media uptick. So when we put this stuff online, all of a sudden people are talking about Vitamin String Quartet. They're the ones who gave it the abbreviation. That's where Vita, that's where VSQ comes into play. So it wasn't us signing bands, although I was trying to do that at CMH as well. It was really us taking this thing that, it wasn't exactly shapeless, but it didn't have a very particular direction until around that time. And you know, working conservatively with more arrangers, producers, players, trying to put them in front of the camera or on the stage or on social media so that the players and the people involved in making the, these records that people wanted to see, they could finally see them and have some sort of attachment to who it was that was making the music. Even though at the end of the day, the series, the, the brand really starts with us. We come up with all the ideas for album releases, why we do what we do, how we do it, et cetera. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And, and where, <laughs> does vitamin, where, where does vitamin come from? Do you have like an affinity for supplements or something? <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to figure out exactly why it was given that name in the sense of the label. Because like I said, it was Vitamin Records putting out these string quartet albums and the company's owner 
David Harley, he had a partner at the time. He was the one who gave the name Vitamin Records, but it's just something that came off the top of his head. I'm still not entirely sure why Vitamin. There's still no real elegant answer to why it's Vitamin String Quartet, other than necessity being the mother of invention. Just us reacting to this name that was given by someone who's um, no longer with the company now. Yeah, fair enough. Well, yeah, yeah Aaron? Uh, yeah, I don't have an answer either, but the it would be funny to, <laughs> if, <laughs> yes, we love supplements. And, <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's, that's it. You got it. You know, I, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I don't know the origin story, but, um, but it's a good name. It, it kind of, you know, it is, it's a little like, uh, not, you know, a little mysterious, a little unclear, but you can sort of, I don't know. It kind of, I feel like it, it, it represents, you know, who we are as a group and what we do. So you could say that it's something you need daily. I mean, that's a perfect <laughs> Ooh. something you need daily. To I'm, get. I'm writing it down. That's yeah. Right. We'll take exactly it to the next meeting. You need us daily for fill in the blank for whatever. But I think, is. you know, with what James was saying, clearly we are now, it, it looks a little different today, right? Like what, sure. we're, what we're doing and the things that, again, like you said, why they're resonating the way, these tracks where and how now we're morphing and changing. And it is, you know, like any other artist that sort of reinvents him or herself or just moves in new directions as they sort of see, you know, that they're drawn to. And the through line for us is that, well, it's a string quartet and it's, you know, we're primarily making covers, but with that said, uh, we'll work on different projects, right? If it's a different genre, we can go there. We're not necessarily stuck to, you know, just pop, just hip hop, just rock, where we can kind of branch out in many dire like directions that maybe not all artists feel empowered to do, which is kind of a pretty cool thing for us to yep. have that kind of flexibility. And yet it's like, oh yeah, that's BSQ. Oh yeah, that's a that's that string quartet sound. That's that production. That's that arrangement, you know? And so yep. um, it's kind of nice to have that through line that's not so obvious, right? It's not that we only cover certain artists. It's not that we only work in a genre. And so we have a lot of flexibility in that sense. And, you know, the four songs that ended up uh, placing in Bridgerton 10, yes, they're pop, I guess, yeah. but there's variety there too. And we get to work, right. It's four different artists that cover very different markets, you know, as themselves, right. Those recording artists appeal to different fans and we're able to sort of, uh, you know, try to do our version, some justice, you know? And so I think it's really cool. And the way it started the quartet, I think totally, you know, uh, informs how we're able to move and how nimble we are today. And so I think, I think it's great. You know, we're, yep. we're just continuing to refine and try new things and kind of keep going and see where it makes sense. And then sometimes, you know, it doesn't, and then you learn and you pivot and you move on, you know? So it's a, it's a really cool process that we have here. So very, very cool. And you've yeah. shown that doing something different really still can work in the modern world, which is an amazing, amazing story for anyone out there who's worrying about being unique or a little bit different. So um, Bridgerton's music supervisor is, of course, the very greatly respected Alexandra Petsavas, and you'd worked with her previously, hadn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we, we were approached by Alexandra and her firm Chop Shop uh, about, oh gosh, it seems like forever ago, it might be 10 years now, that we did um, Gossip Girl. They were looking for, there was this big wedding in one of the last seasons of Gossip Girl where one of the main characters, Blair, was, she's getting married. And they wanted, again, this kind of contemporary string quartet because that's very much part of who we are and what we do, whether intentionally or otherwise. People love hearing these romantic covers of pop songs and modern music. So they were looking for not only a string quartet to have the music featured in the show, but we were also on camera very briefly. And we're lingering somewhere in the background at Blair's wedding, uh, doing a couple of uh, covers. We did a Pat Benatar song in excess to And that was, that was also one, it was one of our first sort of appearances on camera for people to see us, but it was also definitely one of the biggest placements we've received up until that time. Oh, amazing. And so how different was that process of working on Gossip Girl to Bridgerton or maybe how similar was it? Um, a little 
different in the sense that um, initially they knew exactly what song. When, when Gossip Girl happened, they had one song in mind. They wanted to do one song with us with the potential of doing maybe a second. And I don't want to throw the, the writer, artist, publisher under the bus, but essentially the song they wanted to do, the publisher was like, no, we don't let people use that song anymore for any purpose, et cetera, et cetera. And so they came back to us and said, well, we can't use this. We have another song in mind, but it's not in your catalog, which is the Pat Benatar cover, uh, the song of, cover of her song, We Belong. And we said, well, we'll cover it. <laughs> we'll cover it for you right now. You want it? And uh, so we worked up that. And while we were working that up, they also saw that we had this NXS cover. And they're like, yes, we're definitely going to take a second song. So that one was very much like they knew what they wanted. They couldn't get what they wanted initially. And so they commissioned us to do one. And then they had a second song that they pulled from the catalog. This with Bridgerton was a little bit more open-ended. They knew that we had this extensive catalog and Aaron can speak to this because he's first contact for so much of this. But this was a little bit different in the sense that they came to us and it was a little bit more open. They had a few ideas, but they just gave us the brief and then we kind of reacted to that, sending our selection. They had some ideas. and It was a real collaboration in the sense of trying to figure out what was going to work, but there were no commissions involved and it was a little bit more... It, it also took a little longer to figure out. The Gossip Girl thing happened very quickly. But Aaron, I don't know if you want to speak. Yeah, to well, Bridgerton. speaking on Bridgerton in particular, um, yeah, that brief came in and, you know, and maybe this speaks to larger, I don't know, sync advice in general, but briefs will come in and the, the idea is that, you know, you read it down and you're there to work with production. Like they've got a bigger picture in mind. They've got a whole arc. You know, your song isn't the only one that's being placed. And you're just, you're slotting into this bigger picture that they've created and they're painting and they've worked over and over and over again. And finally, they might come to the musicians or the artists and say, you know what, this is really going to be the cherry on top for us. What kinds of songs can you help paint this picture, you know? And so that's the way I approach the briefs and I always tap James for help. And we have a few other people that help me put playlists together and sort of send it back to a production company or say, hey, that's the type of brief you're looking for. Uh, what about these 10 tracks? What do you think about this? This is a good jumping off point. And so, it, yeah, it was a bit more open, but um, we also fully understood that Bridgerton had a tone set, you know, and that yeah. we were going to just elevate that as best as we can, you know? Yeah, the brief very much outlined, you know, this is a romantic show. This is the plot. It is a very female character driven show. It's um, definitely going to be airing on the side of cooler and more contemporary. So the first round of songs we sent them, some of them might have been a little too indie and a little too cool, but a lot of those first wave of songs were informed by that. We were looking for female artists that we covered. We were looking for contemporary artists we covered. We were trying to slant things a little bit more romantic, maybe a little playful. And so you, to Aaron's point, you have to work with the brief you're given and hopefully the people who are handing you those briefs, ha briefs have as much detail as we were given for Bridgerton because it was a lot for us to, to play with, essentially. Yeah, which is super helpful when, yeah. when they give you enough boundaries to work within and then you can kind of push a little and break some yeah. rules and throw a few tracks in there like, oh, maybe, you know, and you just you try, you see what sticks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, I would say if, if you're getting briefs coming in from a production, like, you know, read it and make sure you're really responding. Like, you know, if they're looking for something and you don't necessarily fit the brief, don't force it, you know, but yeah. luckily when they come to us, there's a very uh, clear, pretty clear understanding. Of, like we're looking for these kinds of strings, which makes our job much easier. It's like, great, we've got them. So yeah, I think it, it just, it worked out. There was an openness and they were willing to work with us and we pitched and it, it, it all, kind of, you know, came together. It was great. So, Well, you've segued very nicely into my next question, which is all about the brief. So I think you've covered half of it already. But before I go there, did you say an in excess song? But I, you know, I'm an Aussie. I have to know. Which song was oh, it? I, it was uh, uh, Never Tear Us Apart. <gasps> Such a good cover. I mean, we did a, a live video of it. It's up on YouTube right now. It's It's one of my favorite pieces of music. I mean, I'm a big crier, 
Aaron probably knows this. I'm very emotional. And I'll tell you, one of the th- I, I watched that Michael Hutchins documentary when that came out, and I was just like bawling by the it's so, <laughs> so I love In Excess so much. I mean, Kick is one of the great albums of the 80s. It is. I agree. Incredible. I agree. And you said, and Aaron said that you're a great laugher. So, like, the two of you are really like a match made in heaven. Yeah. One we're laugh, one cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the meetings go off the rails very quickly. <laughs> it's just, um, but yeah, and, and a part of it is, you know, us loving the artists matters. You know what I mean? We, that's part of the A&R. And again, you know, James can touch on this because that's sort of what he spearheads. But the briefs come in and it, it's, it's the greatest feeling when you've done what you already do and it just fits what they need, right? There's a perfect sort of like, we're looking for this kind of thing. Oh, VSQ does exactly that. And that's part of the briefs and the A&R and the curation. It's like we approach the original recording artist with a, a sense of respect and say, this is something we want to, you know, do our own take and our own spin because like I listen to the original or the, you know, the recording on my own time and then VSQ does their cover. And so it's, it's a cool, uh, I think a sincere kind of homage, you know, to the original recording artist. And then we just put our spin on it. And if it happens to work for the brief, that's, it's, you know, that is, that's a great feeling and it just locks in and we're all on the same page and production wants it. We want it to happen and it just moves in the right direction. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what happened with Bridgerton. So. Yeah. So for all the artists and composers out there who, who have never seen a brief at that level, the level of Bridgerton or Gossip Girl or something like that, can you just kind of segment it out for us? What does it look like? And I know briefs vary, but what did it look like for Bridgerton? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they vary, but they they don't. I mean, the a, a brief should basically cover the same amount of material, you know, from one brief to another. And the idea is, you know, this is who we are. This is the project we're working on, uh, whether it's film, television, advertisement, you know, here's the title of it. And here's a synopsis. We're just breaking down the actual content of, you know, this thing. And then here's the specific use maybe we're thinking of for you, right? There's a scene here. Here's the scene description. We're interested in either a particular track or this is the kind of feel we're going for, right? Up-tempo, right. happy, uplifting versus somber and dark and, you know, give us a, make it feel like there's tension in the scene, right? And so the more details you get from production, the easier it is for us to kind of separate what tracks in our catalog work and what don't, right? right? Um, and then there's some other details, right? Is it for television versus, uh, you know, like a video on demand, Netflix servicing, that type of, you know, so you figure out like, where is it going to live? Is it just a, an ad online? And so some of those details uh, are mostly covered in each brief. And it just informs the sync department, the sync team, like what production's looking for, you know, which is super helpful for us. And then I take that information, I forward it to whoever I need to internally. We come up with a curated playlist and we pitch it back, you know. Sorry, that's puppy in the house. <laughs> yeah, I thought, wow, how did you do that? You, you kind of threw your voice over there and it came out as a puppy. <laughs> um, but yeah, the briefs generally cover that kind of information. Right. Right, James, anything to add there? No, I mean, again, it's a, it's called a brief for a reason. It's usually something very simple, almost like a, like a, a memo that outlines the basic usage. And then, you know, once everything else is decided, then there's a much larger paperwork. But really, it's a, a brief says it all. That, that The name says it all. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Aaron Silverstein and James Curtis from CMH Label Group, the team behind Bridgerton's classical pop covers. It's time for industry truths. Dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. All right. So, first question is: Do you watch the shows that you place music into? Yes, I do. I don't get a chance to watch everything as thoroughly as I would like. I still need to pick up some of Bridgerton, but uh, I definitely do. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron? that's it's a yes, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. We try to, yeah, watch as much as we can, especially, of course, if we're part of it, but also not, you know, and know what's going on in the world and know what else other people are making. Just, you know, understand the 
There's so much now, though. That's there's a lot. There's a lot to watch. There's so much television. There's so much content. It's almost impossible to keep up, and especially if you have to do it for your job, too. Some days at the end of the day, you're like, I don't want to watch television. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to watch anything right now. I find myself lately wanting to watch things that have nothing to do with our current cultural climate. Like I've watched modern shows, but then I want to go watch like old reruns of Columbo and the Rockford Files or Golden Girls, something so far removed from what we are all supposed to be watching. Yeah, or I'll watch something and it's like, oh, I wonder how they cleared that. Like, oh, yeah. how did they how did they get that song in there? And I'm like, I can't even follow the plot because I'm just listening, <laughs> you know, to the soundtrack, which is okay. It's fine. You know, I'm glad I like what I do, but work imposing its will upon yeah, you. Yeah, it's like wow they got that artist you know so. yeah well the question is then um are you able to sit back and watch a show and just enjoy it and get lost in it or are you constantly kind of music supervising it i mean Aaron, yeah, i mean no I, I can definitely watch i think i have to like in the mindset is i'm gonna sit down and watch this comedy and laugh like that's my job you know so yeah or but yes yeah, sometimes I'll watch films and the soundtrack and it's not a distraction. It really is. I'm just pulled in by the music because it's really good and it works, you know? And so, yeah, sometimes the music for sure is the main focus unintentionally for me. Yeah, fair enough. Well, so I wanted to move into um, the the artist perspective a little bit with you. Uh, I, I know speaking as a previous artist, how impactful it is when you find someone who actually knows what they're doing to believe in you as an artist and your music. And I know like how much of a huge amount of resources that go into driving and maintaining that traction for that artist. Sometimes it just doesn't work out though. Right. So when do you determine it's just not working? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, for us with VSQ, that, that is the principal artist. There are other things that we do at the label, but as far as a focus for VSQ, it's not so much a question of whether or not they're working. It's a question of whether or not a project's working. And it's, you know, I think that one of the hardest things to do with so many stakeholders involved at the label is to kind of keep everybody on the same page. And if that's just a daily chore anyways, but if it's just not really happening naturally, if the struggle becomes too great, it's almost kind of like a relationship, right? Relationships are work. They say that, right? But if a relationship is too much work, then it's not working. It's the same thing. There are just some projects where it's the work becomes excessive and there's a sort of loss involved and you have to go, that's it. It's, this isn't working. That's plain and simple for me. I can't think of another way to say it with regards to the VSQ stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, I have other things that I've been involved with as far as artists go, but that's actually kind of true too. If it's almost like a relationship, if it's too much of a struggle to kind of keep things afloat, it's time to separate ties. Yeah. And how do you have those tough conversations when it's time to cut the ties? That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a tough one too, because you do have to sort of figure out like at what point you're at some kind of a loss and you're, and when you're so deep in an investment of time, more than anything, it's time. A lot of times there's money already being spent on things, but a lot of time it's time and you're living with something and you don't want to let it go. Um, whether that's a particular project, whether that's a person that you're working with. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to make that call. You know, sometimes you wind up stalling a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you've kind of made up your mind that something's not working, it's sooner rather than later. You just kind of kind of put it out there. Whether that's saying to the crew, this piece of music isn't working or this design is not working or this person isn't working anymore. You just kind of have to have those hard conversations sooner rather than later once you realize that. But that also, you kind of procrastinate on that too because you've invested so much already. Well, that analogy of the relationship, that's just so perfect. I, I've never been in a bad relationship, <laughs> but I've heard of other people who've had. And then, you know, you stall, you stall, and then finally, 
sometimes you need that catalyst to actually break up. Yeah. And then afterwards it's like, does everyone come out of the woodwork and tell you that, oh, I never liked him or her? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing too. It's really hard because you never know what the straw is going to be. You know, what's that final break? But that's usually how it happens. There's usually an inciting incident, something that goes, that's it. Obviously, we've all been sort of in denial and this hasn't been working, but now it's clear as day. Now we got to do something about it. Yeah, fair you enough. You can plan that out. You can never plan when those are going to happen. No, of course not. That makes total sense. Um, Aaron, how about I ask you this one? If you could go back in time and give advice to your younger self, what would that be? Mm-hmm. Probably ask more questions, you know? You're in, you're in a meeting and people use abbreviations and these terms and that term and you're like, uh-huh. And you leave the meeting and you have no idea what was covered. And it's like, <laughs> just, you know, you don't have to interrupt the whole meeting, but pull somebody aside later and maybe, hey, look, there are these like six terms that people kept repeating. I don't know what these abbreviations are. You know, and it's it's um, it's totally okay not to know. You know, it's, it's totally fine. And I'm saying it because I didn't necessarily always do it. Right. I'm saying it because I didn't totally listen to that advice, but um, I got to a certain point as I worked in the school. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, puppy. <laughs> um, I got to a certain point where I wasn't afraid to ask questions and that just made my job easier. You know, so now when you hit that comfort level where you don't have to pretend to know, that's I think that's a really good place to be. So I, I would say get there as soon as possible. You know. Yeah, yeah, I've reached that point. Like the older you get, the the faster that you get there, you don't really care. James, what about you? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of uh, a synonym for that would be uh, assuming you don't know anything. You know, one of the classic music industry, entertainment industries is that nobody knows anything. And so you should treat everything like a learning experience, whether that's asking mm-hmm. questions whether sometimes it's just sitting back and listening, you know what I mean? Like it, nobody has the answers all the time. You know, you have to fake it a little bit because decisions have to be made. Somebody has to finally say go, but even that's not really an answer. It's all kind of a guessing game. Everything in our industry is a roll of the dice. You don't know what's going to hit and you don't know what's going to fail. You have to sort of, give everything the same equal amount of attention because it's it once you've done something it doesn't uh it's not about you it's about the audience you can't control how people are going to respond to whatever so uh asking questions but also just assume nobody has the answers either like assume or assume you don't have the answers you just it's all kind of it's all kind of a gas have a little fun with it <laughs> and learn from it yeah, I love it. What's the expression? Dare to be dumb? Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. That's about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling very daring right now. Um, so uh, what are some tips that you could share with anyone who wants to pitch their music to secure a placement? Um, yeah, do, do your homework. Know who you're pitching to. Know what their previous shows and placements look like. Find where your music or similar types of music is already getting placed, you know, and be, be humble, but do your homework and be confident and know what you do well. Right. But also don't force it. Like we said, read the brief or try to find people who are working on a project. If you're not getting the briefs, right. Say, Hey, I saw this previous show you worked on. I think uh, these tracks might be a good fit for your upcoming project. I would love it if you could give me some feedback. That's it. You know, keep it short, simple. People are getting music submissions all the time. So make sure you do the homework for them. Right know what they're in pre-production and what they're already working on. Try to get ahead of the curve, check IMDB, look at things that allow you to kind of understand the landscape and try to find the right lane, you know, and know yourself. What are your strengths? Where does your music resonate? What genre, what style? Is it female vocals, male vocals? Is it instrumental, right? Like know where you fit in Um, and do that confidently instead of worrying about trying to like, you know, fit into every single brief, right? Just make sure you're doing what you're doing, do it well, and then, you know, opportunities will come along. Great tip, James. Yeah, 
couldn't have said it better myself. The one thing I would say is in this day and age with everything being technologically driven to Aaron's point, make sure that your music, when it's available for someone to preview on some kind of system is tagged accordingly. You know, that's, that, that, that's, gets a little forgotten sometimes. Maybe some people might actually overemphasize that. So that might be preaching to the choir with some people in sync, but knowing what it is about your catalog that you're offering, which in our catalog is pretty extensive. So there's a lot of different tags that can be affixed to any master, but knowing, like Aaron said, the practical things, your genre, what is it that leads it? What are the principal instrumentation? Make sure all those tags are in there, your genre tags, your mood tags, that because that's also a key thing too. A lot of times these people are going in and looking for those things and they're not going to be waiting for you to pitch to them so much as they're going to look at how everything's tagged and that's pitching it for them. Mm, and for those artists out there who may have gotten an invitation to come and meet with a label, what should they never do? Uh, don't be late. <laughs> <laughs> don't be late. No, that's just me personally. I'm, I'm big on punctuality. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, don't be late. Don't assume anything. Keep the vibe kind of pleasant and open. Going back to the things that Aaron and I were saying about knowing, you know, things that we've learned. Again, asking questions, be a little bit loose. Don't assume anything. You know what I mean? Uh, hopefully, if they really want you, you won't have to oversell yourself. Just kind of, you know, it, it sounds lame, but it's almost like be yourself. You know what I mean? And don't yeah. try to be anything you're not because that's that's never going to help you in any fashion whatsoever. Or because you get caught on who you're not later. Eventually. Yeah, exactly. If it does work, you got to pretend for the rest of your career, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. you got lies on top of lies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if you know your material and where you where you're strong, you know where your strengths are, then. You know, it'll be a good fit or it won't. And it's okay if it's not, you know? Yeah. And be your authentic self. And if your authentic self is some crazy show tune driven electronic carnival esque madness, and that's your authentic self. Cool. You know, be that if you're really a little bit more mellow singer, songwriter, much more reserved, be the, you know, whatever that authentic self is that that's, that's a key thing. Back on now with Aaron Silverstein and James Curtis, our guests from CMH Label Group, the team behind Bridgerton's classical pop covers. It's time for In Five Words or Less. So I'm going to throw questions at you guys. And in five words or less, you give me your answers. So we'll go question, Aaron, James. Question, Aaron, James. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. Great. Let's do it. Okay. All right. What's the first song you loved? Definitely a Beatles tune. Not sure which one, but the Beatles. Was that five words? <laughs> the Beatles. <laughs> okay. uh, something on MTV in the 80s. I think that might have been it. Okay. <laughs> What's up? Okay, question two, question two. Proudest career moment. Man. <laughs> uh, that was five words or less. <laughs> coworkers, good team, good coworkers. That's really. James. Uh, I haven't had it yet. <laughs> Ooh, Ooh, mysterious. Oh. <laughs> okay. Are we going to take you on offline? Okay, biggest career faux pas. Ooh, pretending to know. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite pitching tool. Ooh, how tech email? <laughs> how technical <laughs> are we getting? <laughs> Oh, however technical you want to get. A good email. <laughs> that, that's technical. Okay. Uh, Spotify playlists. 
Oh, that's good, actually. <laughs> okay, too <laughs> late. Too late, too late. Too late, Aaron. Okay. Uh, must have when at work. I have mug. I have a coffee mug all the time with me. Yeah, I don't know why. Sorry, that's way more than coffee mug. <laughs> uh, cell phone. Mm -hmm. What did you want to be when you grew up? Mm. Soccer player, athlete. Oh. Uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Oh, it's not too late. <laughs> um, what did your What did your parents want you to be? Happy. Oh, <laughs> sincerely. <laughs> oh, that's just, just <laughs> and see. <laughs> yeah, not my parents. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Oh, you're going to have to go and ask him. All right. <laughs> All right. Your relaxation go to? Naps. <laughs> I don't really relax. <laughs> <laughs> gonna have to go and have a good cry and then that'll relax you that's like therapy isn't it all right yeah. next question who would you like to be for a day mm. a zookeeper i like animals oh. that's a good one yeah <laughs> it's like matt damon <laughs> <laughs> ah huh <laughs> oh boy do we need some um, white music mike patton. i'm sorry to say that again mike patton oh i want to live in his head for <laughs> it's kind of weird but that's true okay we'll, we'll take that i'm not going to get it well and the next question is why <laughs> Why zookeeper for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why zookeeper? Oh, it's, why not? You know, animals, <laughs> all kinds of animals, <laughs> taking care of them, hanging out, feeding them. <laughs> and cleaning out the cages. Um, James? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would want to, again, I kind of want to live inside his head that uh, in a way VSQ, like Aaron was saying, gives us a chance to really experiment. But I also think that there's more that could be done. And if there's one person I think is probably just doesn't give a shit and doesn't care what people expect from him, he just does what he wants, it would be Mike Patton. So being able to have that, that point of view for a whole day and that freedom where no one's checking you, that would be fun. I love it. That, that was five words, yeah? No. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's like, it's like when I pour myself a glass of wine, right? Like I have one glass of wine a night, but the size of the glass varies. Yes, it does. Yeah, that's the same concept. Okay, so your next question. <laughs> Five <laughs> it's ounces. It's like pouring a bottle of wine into another bottle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the next question is, what's that tune? I want you guys to name this tune. So... Um, oh, I actually no. did a. I oh, know. I'm sorry. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so um, I really, I actually did a lot of work to prepare for this. Like a, an hour ago, um, I was still <laughs> blowing stuff, and I'll tell you why. So we couldn't get Vitamin String Quartet in to play this tune, but mm. I was fortunate enough to get one of LA's top instrumentalists. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Meet Vitamin. <laughs> This is vitamin string. <laughs> and um, you wouldn't believe it. Like, the, he actually plays. and I, I don't believe it. <laughs> let's, let's see it. Well, so I tested it out with Genia before. Genia's our tech guy, for anyone who wants to know. And it's not working. I must have Oh, no. Oh. So you got to sing it. Oh. You, you're going to sing it for us? You're going to have to sing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Okay, don't ask me. Okay, I'm not going to do that, but I, I prepared something else for you. Okay. Are you ready? Probably not. <laughs> I will see, we'll see. Please work. Were you waiting? You didn't know it yet? That's why I just kept it going, not because I wanted to dance and make a fool of myself. I'm, I'm drawing a blank, so I, I need more Again, time. I know yeah. that song. We've covered it, and I just well, I, I can't get the words out of my mouth. Okay, and that, was, <laughs> take two, take two. As soon as I heard the melody. Uh, Do it. it. You, you want me to start it again? No, 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 no different song. <laughs> Give us a... What was it? I, thought, I only prepared one. Oh, like, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I had vitamin and oh, he's not okay. working. Like he played, um, what's the, when you're down and you're near, you know, um, what's his name? It's a, um, guitarist, um, singer-songwriter, James Taylor. Oh, oh yeah, yes, yeah. yes, we do. Yes. Yeah, no, so take my word for it. He played <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah, but the other one, okay, I'll give you a hint. Uh, <laughs> she's Australian. I didn't it, do this Sia, isn't it? I'm sorry, who? It's Sia. Yes. But was that Cheap Thrills? I couldn't remember the dang song. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. Oh I'm, I'm doing that thing where I'm going through all the different artists in my head, all these female vocalists, and I'm like, why can't I remember this? But I know the song. Like I said, I started singing it before. Uh, Sia, if you're tuning in. We apologize. Deepest, deepest <laughs> apologies from VSQ. Yeah. Uh, we were, this was a curveball. <laughs> I got nervous. I thought we were going to get hit with like 10 of those. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't do that to you. But that's a really good idea. So you thought that was a curveball. Okay, I've got one last bonus question for you. Okay. I really wanted to get an answer to this. If you had to choose between courting a lady in 19th century Britain, <laughs> so that means you got to line up with the gifts. you got to, you, you have to ask the father's that, that one. Her, that yes. or you haven't heard the alternative oh, yet. It, I didn't, okay, fine. Okay. Yes, what's the other option? <laughs> <laughs> or wear a corset. Which would you choose? Oh, I've worn a corset before. So <laughs> I can wear a corset no the, for, Just like in general, just put it on. Or to, to court. Hey, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever floats your boat. No, a uh, former, former. The the like I don't maybe it's not line dance what do you call them like <laughs> the courting <laughs> dance scenes like that's I I wish we that's how we like we should still party like that that's how we should you know right come on like forget the clubs forget all this you know everyone lines up and you do your like you know come on <laughs> let's bring it I, back I agree <laughs> okay. I feel like we've lost a lot of tradition and that kind of you know uh, exactly yeah. that. Lots okay. of flowing gowns. Flowing yeah. gowns and, did you choose? Did you choose like the first question, or I mean, you want to court a young lady, or would you rather wear a corset, James? I don't think you chose. Lady, court a young lady in the nineteenth century. Yeah, that sounds like too much work. Squeezing into a corset's easy. <laughs> like I said, I've done it before. I used to do it all the time. I used to go to screenings of Rocky Horror when I was a kid. James, James, love is not path of least resistance. <laughs> oh, I love it. Love should, like I said earlier, doesn't have to be that much work either. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're here with Aaron Silverstein and James Curtis, our guests from CMH Label Group, the team behind Bridgerton's classical pop covers. It's time for You Asked, where we answer questions from our community. So you guys ready to answer some questions? 
bring it up. Let's well, I guess it. you've been doing that all the way through, I guess, but <laughs> these ones are from our community. All right. So which was VSQ's favourite song to compose or perform? Ah, uh, from, from the Bridgerton stuff or from anything at all? Well, I, that's just what the question says, so I guess it's an open book. Oh, man, there's so many. There's so much to think of. Um, I, I, it might not be a song. It could be almost any song off of the last Bjork album that we did. Ar- arranging that record, though it was a little tough, was a lot of fun and was great work. That's just a great artist to, to, to get to play in that sandbox of her music. So for me, it would be anything from that Bjork album. Yeah. Or, uh, what's that Daft Punk? Is it Touch? There's a Daft Punk. Oh, track. that too. That's actually a perfect answer too. Yeah. The studio, uh, is, the studio version we did is good, but our live version is so, we've refined that thing. It is so perfect. Now. It's, it's also cool uh, just translating Daft Punk to strings, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's just a cool, you know. So. Yeah. It was kind of sweet seeing their farewell video end with that song because that song is very, very personal for us as well. So that was really cool. I was going to say, you're going to have to carry the torch on now that they've split. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that punk music to cover that we haven't, so I'm down for that. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, so what was your reaction to the overwhelmingly positive experience or positive response from audiences around the world? excited it was yeah. overwhelmed is a good way of putting it one one thing that was really cool and i think the whole team felt it was people heard us on bridgerton and then checked us out let's say on you know a, a spotify or a dsp or something and they were like look at this huge catalog and we just opened up this you know treasure chest and we're just going to start going through it and it's just feeling like it landed because of the show you know but also because there's just there's a lot to explore in the catalog and that was that was really cool. It was like initial support and then like continued support, you know, and that's awesome. Yeah. It was the, the seeing our social media numbers, everything grow was cool. I think one of the things that I sort of loved because I spend too much time on YouTube and you constantly see those things on YouTube where like the comment sections are full of like, Oh, this brought me here or this brought me here. And seeing that on a bunch of our music videos where now all of a sudden people are like, who's here because of Bridgerton, those kind of things were kind of fun and, and, and cute. You have to give a better way to say it. it was cute to see that kind of response, you know, because you see it so frequently in so many other places. So to see the placement translate for people so personally, that was fun. I bet. Uh, so how do you decide which projects you will license music to? Oh, whoever gives us the most money. <laughs> no, James. No, 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 I'm being, I'm being um, I mean, there's a lot of conversation that goes on there. I mean, Aaron, you, again, you can also speak to that too. But yeah, um, well, this you know the studio recording stuff. Who we cover in the first place, right? James spearheads most of that, and it's a group conversation with the VSQ team. And this is unrelated to sync. This is like, what projects do yeah. we want to record? What do we want to work on? And then. Later down the line, you know, we start to sort of listen to the catalog and say, ooh, what might fit in a more cinematic film picture use? But we don't necessarily think of that all the time. It's, it's no. we, we create what we want, right? And then it's, again, if it's the perfect storm and it all lines up and it looks great on picture, you know, that's, that's the cherry on top, so. Yeah, I tend to think of things very cinematically. Like I said, I wanted to be a filmmaker, so having a chance to do that when we're even making arrangements, that's just a byproduct of how I, how I think. And, and of course, string quartets also just have a wonderfully cinematic quality to them. Um, so that definitely helps when people are approaching us because so many people see the v- inherent value of that. Um, <clears throat> as far as who we do and do not allow to license our material, you know, all joking aside, um, I, 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 we haven't yet been hit with a, uh, a project where we were just like ethically or morally against what was going on. Every time someone approaches us, it seems fun. It seems to really fit in our world. It seems like they get what we do. Otherwise they wouldn't be approaching us. 
Um, and again, that's because we either have this romantic quality or the cinematic quality, and it just kind of works with whatever it is that they've, uh, they've approached us for. And we've done a lot, you know, um, we've been in films and televisions and, th- and television shows and, and not just in narrative, but also like, I think some of our earliest placements were in things like, so you think you can dance an American idol and you're just like, Oh, that's fun. That's fun. That's, you're, you're part of the larger musical conversation. So, um, you know, I, I don't think, like I said, I don't think we've hit, been hit with something where we're just like, nah, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're super grateful. I don't mean to sound cheesy or anything like people reach out to us and say, we really like this recording you did. We want to, how can we get your recording on our project? And, you know, whether at the end of the day it pans out for what, however many number of reasons, if it does or doesn't like that outreach is, is really nice. I appreciate it. And I'm the one going through those, you know, the sync briefs and people reaching out, how do I get your song on this project? And it's just like, that's, that's really validating. That's really cool. You know, very much so. Yeah. So, yep. Not cheesy at all. <laughs> okay. It must be an amazing <laughs> feeling. Okay. Next question. What do you notice music supervisors look for when licensing music for film or TV? Hmm. Aaron, you want to? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, it, it depends. Certain people have their own style, right? They work within certain types of shows, they, they want certain music cues and right. So everyone kind of has their own world that they live in and operate in. And um, so when you've got soups, music supervisors that, you know, know what they want, then you kind of, you get to work with them or sometimes your catalog doesn't fit and that's okay too, you know? So. Yeah. I think there's a benefit to when we're approached a lot of times, there are a variety of why we're being approached, but we're lucky in that what we do fits so well with a couple of common threads. One is characters in movies and shows are always getting married and they tend to be younger people. So they're always looking for a contemporary song that's been translated to a string quartet because people do that in real life. We're constantly approached for by, by, by just fans who are like, I want your sheet music. Would you play our wedding? Et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, narratively, that works when you're in a show like Gossip Girl or Modern Family, where people want our music for wedding scenes because it makes sense. And then the other side of that, which is where you run into your Bridgertons and your Westworlds and the show like Rain, is people have some sort of narrative juxtaposition that they want to make. You know, this almost sort of anachronistic, like, oh, we're doing a period piece, but we want to evoke something modern. Or in the case of Westworld, it's a sci-fi thing, but of course that sci-fi thing is evoking something, period. So again, that juxtaposition is perfect for what we do. It's classical music, but it's contemporary repertoire. Or, well, sorry, I should say classical instrumentation and contemporary repertoire. So that most of the time, that's what the, it's one of those two things. And then there's other interesting little things that come up as well. Mm, amazing. Uh, what tips do you have for artists trying to license their music? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, um, I think, again, uh, we touched on this a bit earlier. Um, do, do the research, do the homework, right? Know your own material and your own catalog, what kind of sound. Um, if you have lyrics, like thematically, what are you singing or talking about, right? Is it hope and happiness and home or is it not? And you're talking about other things like make sure that, um, you know, you're, you can advocate for your own material and then figure out where it can live, you know, and find the production company or the team, find the music supervisor who might be working that, um, and, and be nice and cordial and (laughs) polite and send them your music and, you know, understand that they're very busy, but that's okay. Like you're trying and you're doing your homework. And if it's a good fit, I think the supervisor genuinely appreciates it, even if it's not the right fit for that show. And they're going to save it. And you might get an email six months, 12 months, two years down the line out of nowhere. Hey, I downloaded this thing. It was on my hard drive. It's a perfect thing for this scene. And you might hear from somebody out of nowhere. You know, you just, you never know. So um, yeah, do, do your homework. And I, I guarantee it'll, it'll pay off. Even if that placement doesn't, you'll learn how to do the research. You'll learn how to reach out and you'll refine that process. So yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. James? Yeah. Do the homework, do the work. You know, again, it, it's also depends on 
you know, whether you're working with a label or whether you're working independently, you can then do the research on if there's a firm that can represent you or if there are libraries that you can have your material added to. And those kind of things will also be informed by who you are. That question about knowing yourself, you'll be able to tell if it's, you know, a person or a firm or a rep or whatever that you want to work with, you should understand who it is that's representing your material um, because you don't necessarily want to be led astray. And you also don't want to be sort of placed in a position where you're just, you're just ticking a box for them either. So you want to be able to like, again, this goes back to that authentic self doing the work, knowing yourself, know who it is that you're working with and don't just jump into any situation to have your music represented. You have to do the, um, unfortunately, the business part of show business is key. You have to do the work. Great tips. And yeah. be on time if you have a meeting. And be on time. Yep. yep. And, Don't show up. Yeah, and have lots of money. No, kidding. <laughs> okay, uh, last question. VSQ is well known for their style of classical covers of pop songs. Do you have any tips for artists trying to find their niche so that their music is more discoverable to music supervisors? Uh, I mean, if, if part of your authentic self is being playful and experimenting and figuring out who you are, then that's a key benefit. You know what I mean? Um, you could be a professional working musician. That's, that's, that's something that if you're out there just hitting the bricks, trying to make covers, trying to think of something interesting, that's, that's something you could really work towards, I guess, in a way. I mean, that find a niche and fill it thing is key. There's, I, I think that there's no denying that cover songs are, are one of the key components for music licensing um, and unique cover songs. You know, if you have a gift for interpretation, if you have a gift for arrangement and understanding like the voicings that can be taken from an original piece and restructured to make something unique, that's, that's a benefit. So again, that's a, that's a do your homework and that's a put the work in kind of thing, you know, uh, some people that just comes naturally. Some people that natural thing to experiment and, and toy around with music comes naturally, but for some that's work and that, that comes with music study. That comes with understanding why a song works and then trying to break it down so you can do something different with it. Um, I can't really think of anything else. <laughs> what, what do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, things that we've touched on before is like your, your music is I can guarantee 100%. You can't guarantee anything in sync, but I can guarantee this 100%. You're not going to get every single brief. You're not going to get every single placement. And that's okay. Like You don't have to fit every single music cue out there in the world. It's just, you know, again, not to sound so cheesy, but like make what you want that you're happy with and yep. you're proud of, and it'll fit. It'll fit where it needs to, and you'll find your you know, maybe it's you're in the indie film scene and it never necessarily goes to broadcast TV advertisement, but that's OK. Like if that's your audience and that's your like, cool, that's your lane. Awesome. You know, and so um, keep doing what you want to. It's a it's a it's for the long haul. VSQ has been doing it for 20 plus years now, you know, and like we appreciate all of the support that we're getting now. But also there have been longtime fans that have, you know been there and seen the progression the growth and so it's like you know if, if there are briefs that don't fit our music we don't force it and that's okay like we don't pretend like we fit and that's fine you know and then when there are briefs that work like bridgerton it's it's great it's a great feeling you know so yeah just just stick to what you really want you know what you want to do and what you want to create and what you're proud of because it shows you know when you're really excited about the material like People, people can feel it. People know, you know, so I think it, it goes a long way. Yeah. And back to Aaron's point and the thing I was sort of talking about earlier, never stop learning, never stop listening to music. Like that's the other thing. Don't ever get tired of music. If you're tired of music, you shouldn't be in the game. You know, keep digging, keep trying to find something interesting. If you're bored with something, keep exploring. And if you're bored with that, then maybe 
maybe music isn't for you. But yeah, I mean, one of the key things about making music is listening to music. So that's another thing for sure. Dig deep. Get some inspiration there. <laughs> oh, so much inspiration. I love that so much. And well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Congratulations once again, guys, Aaron and James. Thanks Thank for your you time. So Thank you. This has been great. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been so much fun. And thanks for being such good sports too. Yeah. <laughs> well, we try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and to our viewers out there, thanks for watching. We hope you found this happy hour valuable and enjoyable. As always, let us know what you'd like us to talk about in these sessions. Be kind to each other. Cheers, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye.